FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. All right. Now here's a signal to sync it all up. Welcome. You are listening to and hopefully even watching the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is 8 18 20. Well, we've seen uh, gold, silver got hit last week. Silver, gold lost uh, 100, almost $115 the ounce. Silver lost over $4 an ounce, but they've come screaming back. And this reminds me a lot of the market in 2010. You'd have these raids. You would have gold and silver attacked, knocked down for a day or so, and then they would come roaring back. And the effect of it uh, was absolutely nothing. It looks like uh, we're caught in a time loop and we're seeing it again. Our good friend uh, Gary Wagner is with us now. And Gary, it's great to have you back. Excellent to be here. Hey, and your site, thegoldforecast.com. So make sure you go check it out. So, Gary, uh, hey, we've been talking for a lot of years now, waiting for this to come. Uh, We kind of reconnected about a year and a half ago, and I was actually in Hawaii. And, And what can you say about this market, huh? It's a most unique market, first of all. In some ways, we can draw a lot of comparisons between the financial crisis of 2008 and the current global pandemic. And the comparison that we can make is really the actions by the Federal Reserve, along with the Treasury Department and the core central banks around the world. In other words, to prop up the economy, they have been having an extremely accommodative monetary policy quantitative easing, if you would, and they brought uh, interest rates to near zero, and in some cases, actually uh, negative. But there's a distinct difference, and this is something that I've been talking about to my subscribers over the last couple of weeks. In 2008 and 2009, once they identified the problem, it was a banking crisis, they had a number of bad loans, banks were going under, there was an end game. There was a solution. In other words, they did uh, the Frank Dobbs Act, which in essence tightened all of the regulations. They propped up the the economy, and over time, things got back, and they actually were the beginning of one of the largest uh, equity markets rallies in history because it really started back in 2009 and to some degree continues to today. The key distinction is we have no end game right now. With the global pandemic until there's a vaccine and with outbreaks continuing to rise, I believe the number of infections is up to about 19 million. There really isn't an end game until they solve the first problem, which is to alleviate the disease or at least get it under control. So in that way, it's different. And what that means to me is that gold will continue to rise. There's not that end game. Well, if you look, uh, the epidemics, pandemics, they follow a very predictable course. Generally, uh, it's a 90-day course. Maybe it's been prolonged because of all the social distancing and all of the uh, lockdowns and everything, which have slowed the spread, arguably, although we don't really know that. Maybe it helps to wear a mask, and maybe it doesn't. We don't know that either. But... The uh, number of deaths is definitely diminishing. We had 400 in the United States yesterday. You can't even believe the numbers. I mean, if the stock exchanges put out numbers the way the CDC does and the U.S. government concerning this uh, epidemic, uh, everyone would be bankrupt because nobody, nobody would know what to do because you'd have no real price discovery and you wouldn't know what market participants are doing. Arguably, some of that happens anyway with high-frequency fraud, HFT, if you will, high-frequency trading. But uh, these numbers, there's something wrong with them, what we're looking at on this chart. Uh, It's And there's politics involved as well. 
So we're getting a very distorted picture. If you look in Sweden, they've got hardly any cases of COVID left in Europe. It's reopening. And now uh, Americans aren't allowed to go to Europe. For a while, Europeans couldn't come to America. My guess is probably going to be done within a month, but the damage is done because the cure here is far worse than the disease. Yeah, I mean, the, this disease has some unique qualities that make it uh, susceptible to having this global pandemic kind of linger. The most important one of these issues is the fact that you can contract the disease, you can be asymptomatic, show zero symptoms, but be a carrier for about two weeks prior to you actually getting sick. So that if individuals are sick, they might not know it and inadvertently affect their family and friends around them. I personally believe social distancing works. And the one thing that I can say is that being in Hawaii, at first we felt comfortable because we were isolated. We had very few cases. We had nine deaths when the rest of the country was experiencing just terrible, terrible loss of life. But then I beckon back to remember what happened to the um, South American Indians when the Spanish invaded. We are so um, clustered and isolated that once they started letting people in, we're now up to 200 plus cases a day when we would have 200 total over a six month period. And it's because there are planes landing now and it is spreading again. So my sense is that in order to get this under control, Social distancing isn't a bad practice to stand six feet apart. I have no, it's mandatory in Hawaii to wear a mask in any store, anywhere that you go. I have no issues with that. Um, what I do have a problem with, and, and I'm a pretty, not liberal, but I, I, I tend to look at myself on the right side rather than the left side. But I hear people saying, well, no one can force me to wear a mask. It's my God-given right to do what I want. But it's not their right to infect somebody else. So in private, do whatever you want. And we found that social distancing does work here. As far as Sweden goes, I believe it's a small population. And I don't know how they kind of alluded that. But look at the examples of the schools trying to open up in Mississippi and other places in the south. They had social distancing practices. They separated the kids and they would close within a week because there'd be 100 cases reported. When people congregate, if you have some that are infected, it will spread. Yeah, well, the thing is this, that uh, most of you out there under the age of 65 have nothing to worry about, a uh, very little chance of mortality. I myself, I'm taking uh, hydroxychloroquine because I'm kind of at that uh, 63, kind of at the edge there. And it showed some good uh, prophylaxis uh, qualities. And the fact is, we see that the lesser developed countries that made hydroxychloroquine available to the general population at large have a fraction of the deaths per million that, uh, that the United States has. But even in Hawaii, you've had 39 deaths, about 5,000 cases. Uh, I don't know about yesterday, but on the 16th of August, you had no deaths. On the 14th, 15th, you had none. Um, on the 12th, you had four. On the 13th, you had two. And, you know, you just really haven't been hard hit by it. So that should tell us something. But uh, obviously, we know who the uh, threatened populations are, segments of the population. Groups. Uh, 65 and elders. Yeah, and uh, nursing homes and comorbidities and all that great stuff. Whatever, right. you know, it doesn't really matter because in the end, uh, they made the decision and we're kind of stuck with the decision for better or for worse. And the question is, are we ever going to be able to dig ourselves out of this? And uh, what's going to happen to the global economy here? My sense is, well, of course, we will dig ourselves out of it. Mankind has been around for eons, and they've managed to adapt to a lot of different environments. Will there be a new normal? I believe that there might be. But of course, the human race is resilient, and we will get um, over it in terms of ending the pandemic at some point. 
the the medicine and the research is so highly tuned at this point. 20 years ago, you couldn't produce a vaccine in a year or even attempt to. But now they have kind of a template of how they do it. They've got a particular disease. It's a terrible one. They take out the bad component of it. They're actually using the AIDS virus in many cases on these tests. They take out the bad component. They put in the gene that needs to um, create the antibodies, and that's what they introduce as a vaccine. So they do have a template. There's multiple companies in first stage testing, but that's not what I believe is going to be the greatest fallout. The fallout is going to occur after the pandemic subsides. The Fed has allocated, they've swelled their balance sheet by another $4 trillion. U.S. Treasury Department spent roughly $3 trillion in aid, and they've got another stimulus package coming. When you add that to the fact that we had the largest contraction of GDP in the history of the United States, what was it, 32 percent? A 32 yeah, percent contraction? Um, that's what is going to be difficult to overcome. It will be, but that will take time. And how that works itself through the system is a question I can't answer. But I don't believe that it is the pandemic that will linger. It's the economic fallout that will linger. Yeah, I always said the cure was worse than the disease. And before you go shutting down a global economy, you have to really look and see if there's alternatives, see who the potential victims are. In states in the United States, uh, we had Killer Cuomo and Murphy the Murderer sending infected patients to nursing homes where the people were most at risk. But in any event, we're not really here to debate the political aspect of it. No, we're, we're not. Yeah, we're here to kind of take a look and figure out where do we go from here, what's happening. So gold, silver, and the economy, show us what you got, Gary. Well, you know, I mean, the, the most important thing that we've seen is the fact that gold has hit new all-time record highs. In fact, on multiple consecutive occasions, we were getting there. Once we broke above 2,000, we continued to rock to the upside. I think the high was 2089. The fact that we had that retracement last week, and I'm calling it a retracement, not a correction, because it was brutal, it was quick, but there were such a large amount of individuals that wanted to enter the market that when that dip came, they bought the dip. In other words, people are flocking to gold. Uh, the ETF GLD has got the largest volume it's ever had. Um, gold right now is extremely expensive. I think it's going much higher. The interesting thing to me is when we saw gold run to a new record high, we had silver only at about $25 to $29. But what's fascinating about silver is that in essence, since March, it's tripled in price. So it's had a much greater uh, move in terms of percentage gains but it hasn't hit those $50 levels that it had before. Uh, the numbers that I'm looking at, we'll look at a chart in a little bit, but the numbers I'm looking at longer term by the end of the year is anywhere between $22 and $2,300. In fact, I published an article in Technical Analysis of Stocks and Commodities. I wrote the article in November and December, submitted it, it came out in April, so right as the uh, pandemic was kind of being known and my numbers then were that we would see during this quarter gold go to 2060. I was off but only by about $30. That was pre-pandemic? Well no 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 in, in April that was just when it was getting discovered. Oh so from when, April. When the article was published but I wrote the article in November when no one knew about it. Right. When I was going through technicals I had no idea that's what would cause it. Huh. So you're pretty darn close there. So we got to take your uh, prognostications here somewhat seriously, Gary. So 22 to 2300, it's about 10 yes. percent above what it is now, and uh, of course it could go still higher. But figure probably it's starting to hit resistance at that point. What are you seeing for silver? Well, right now, I mean. I it's going to challenge and break 30. There's no doubt about that. I believe that if gold continues to break these records, 
silver will eventually come up and test 40 to $50 per ounce without a question, but it requires both of them moving in tandem. Right now we have a unique scenario and, and that is that the Fed is printing money like it's gone, it's like girls gone wild. It is insanity when you consider the amount of assets they are purchasing, purchasing because typically they went with mortgage-backed securities and treasuries. They're buying junk bonds, they're buying yeah. corporate bonds now. And that is something we've never seen the Fed do. The other thing is that in each period of what we call quantitative easing, QE1, QE2, QE3, and then twist when they try to kind of change that around, they had a defined amount that they were going to purchase. Right now, we're set at $120 billion a month of new purchases by the Fed. But the Fed has come out and said they have no upper limit. There's not a point. They're, they're willing to do what it takes for as long as it takes. And that's paraphrasing Chairman Powell, which means that he will keep purchasing more assets. He will keep monetary policy extremely accommodative. He'll keep interest rates near zero for as long as it takes until we see an economic recovery. And we're not going to see an economic recovery that quickly. So what does that do to the dollar? Well, just take a look at a dollar chart. The dollar was trading at 103 mid-March, and that's when everything kind of turned around. It's now at around 92 to 93. My technical studies indicate it could go as low as 88 before finding support. It's already declined by about 10 to 12 percent, and it's got another 8 percent of potential downside. Obviously, when you pair gold against dollar and the dollar goes down, gold has to go up. The only other variable is whether traders are liquidating or accumulating. So when you have traders accumulating and a uh, lower dollar, you've got the perfect storm. You've got the scenario that it takes uh, for gold to really reach the stratosphere, which is basically what it's done. Yeah, yeah. and uh, as usual, gold leads, silver follows. And at some point, silver takes over the lead. I mean, imagine $50 silver, if you will. Probably at that price, we're going to start seeing supply shortages, aren't we? Well, you know, they've talked about there being supply sh shortages for years. I'm not privileged to what the real figures are that come out of the mine, so I can't comment on that. I've read the same news stories that you have probably read, but... I don't know where those facts come from. The one thing that I can say is that the precious metals will continue to have intrinsic value. That intrinsic value will only increase as core currencies decrease in value because that's the other unique aspect uh, to the difference between the pandemic now and the financial crisis. And that is Bank of Japan, Bank of Russia, People's Bank of China, uh, the European Central Bank, all of the major central banks and their core currencies are being devalued. And it seems like it's a race to zero. In other words, who can lessen their currency the quickest? And although gold hit an all-time record high against the dollar, it's hit an all-time record high against the sterling, what, two years ago? Years so ago. It's, it's a comparison of, of the currencies itself. And the key is, is that it is such a concerted effort amongst all the core central banks that they're debasing all of these currencies. And as currencies go lower, what does gold and silver kind of have to do? Everything else remaining equal. It can only go up. Yep, what we have is the race to debase. One thing that does give me poise, pause for thought as far as supply shortages go, is the mines were closed down for three, four months, Gary. It means they weren't producing anything. So that means that all sales, all production of uh, fabricated rounds, maple leaves, uh, Liberty dollars, whatever it is, it's all coming out of inventory of, uh, Correct, of raw metal. Supply. Yeah, and how big is that inventory? We don't really know. We do know probably that uh, consumption of silver as far as industrial consumption is probably down, but that's probably been more than uh, offset judging from prices by, by investor demand. demand. Yeah. 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 So yeah. show us, uh, show us some charts here and let us get a clearer picture. Uh, I'll show you a chart in a second. The one thing I do want to add to what you've just said is 
I, I believe that the U.S. Mint, for one of the first time, ran out of rounds to produce coins. So there was a shortage of the U.S. Mint being able to produce coins. But the one, the one chart that I do want to share, and let me uh, put this up for one second. Just give me a second. And what we're going to look at, and if you could just tell me when it's on the screen, because I don't see it. But okay. what you see is this it's is there. the continuous contract of gold futures. And what I'm doing is what is called a basic uh, Elliott wave extension in which I'm looking at, let me get my annotation things up here. But what I'm basically looking at is a scenario in which as this market moves up like this, we measure this right here, the, the length of the move here. And then what we do is we then start from the end of a correction and then we forecast what it's going to do. In the case of this, the extension is 0.618. And as you can see, my number, it comes in at around, and I'm really bad with a mouse and a pen, but it comes in yeah. at about $2,300 per ounce. And I think that that's actually achievable by the end of the year. Hey, we've only got, to, what do we have? <laughs> it's a short period of time, four and a half months left till the end here. Maybe a little less than that. Uh, yeah. So it's going to have to start working up pretty quickly. Well, well that's an interesting chart, though. But it, it, you're, you're absolutely correct. It would have to go up quickly. But consider this. In mid-March, gold was at $1,450, right? Yeah, it that's true. Roughly, <laughs> roughly $600 in four months. It's about $150 a month. Typically, and I've been an analyst of gold where I've, I've, I, I live and breathe these charts, typically a, 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 a normal rally is $100 to $150, you get a correction. A strong rally is $250 to $300. Yeah. But when you get a rally where it moves from $1450 to $2,000, the only other time we've seen that is in 2008, but the big, di I mean, 2010 to mid-2011. The key difference, though, again, was what happened after gold hit uh, 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 1920. Within days, it just fell out of bed, okay? This time, it hit new highs, went to multiple new all-time highs, and last week's correction, when you look at it, is it's a blip. It's gone. It's, it just doesn't exist anymore. The demand to purchase gold has, has been so great that you get any kind of sizable dip and buyers enter the market. Yeah, and, and that that's dip, a dip lasted a day or two. You know, it was nothing I mean, uh, in the scheme it of started, things. It started the week before on Friday. You had a candlestick pattern called an engulfing um, bearish. The following day, Monday, was a very, very small body candle, meaning the difference between the, uh, the open and the close was very, very narrow. And then, bomb, on Tuesday, it, the shoe dropped out. But then it recovered for two days, moved higher, had a small sell-off. And then we actually went long the market on Sunday. We bought positions of gold at uh, 1955 on Sunday as the market opened up in Australia. We're still sitting along those. And that's the third trade that we have done during this pandemic. And what we're doing now is we've kind of branched out because we're trading silver, we're trading gold, we're trading Forex gold, but we have a lot of subscribers that aren't that comfortable with futures but want to be involved and they're trading slv and gld i've also taken some stabs at nugget and gdx and, and gold so there's all kinds of avenues to be able to participate in this move what will the stock market do well it's kind of confounded me in that it's been as strong as it has but the economy is still there it's just not running on all cylinders but what we're witnessing in terms of demand for the precious metals has, I don't believe, has ever been seen before. Yeah, it's a quite, quite breathtaking. And that chart kind of t says it all there. I mean, like you said, March, we were at 1450. We had a gradual bull market in gold. You know, it's gone from like uh, 1200, 1150, 
back, uh, when was it, uh, summer of uh, 2018, and just kind of gently was going higher, and then all of a sudden just took off, and that's, uh, that's quite telling. So what's the uh, picture look like for silver, Gary? Well, let's see if we can't just pull something up here and move it over. My uh, pause share. Okay, I, I was sharing. Okay. This is just a chart, and let me know if it's sitting up yep. there. Yeah, the uh, candlestick. This is the weekly chart of gold. And so we can certainly see this long red candle here. And what I'm attempting to do is to really plot different levels of support and resistance as the market moves up. Oddly enough, I see major support at 1920, which is the former all time record high. And then in terms of resistance, we have a couple of areas. The top of this candle, and this is the week in which it sold off hard. And then, of course, this all-time record high here at 2,090. That's where I think we'll see resistance. Does that mean we'll pull back? No, we might consolidate and go sideways. And these are actually the trades that we sent out on uh, Sunday. So we've actually got good profits in these. I will try to pull up another chart, but I'll stop sharing first till I pull it up. But we'll take a look at silver. And silver has just been extremely dynamic. I mean, it's the, one of the few metals that actually has tripled in what, two and a half months? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. ridiculous. So we don't need to say, I just let me get these off. And I'm trying to see where my, there we go. So let's pull up silver. And then. Attention, an alert target has been reached. Yeah, we know that. <laughs> while we're online, hey, it's while we're online. From this thing is alert targets have been hit because they, they're constantly being hit. <laughs> well, that's a good thing, I guess, huh? Uh, yeah, it's, it's not a bad thing. Uh, okay. okay, so we're going to take a look at uh, silver, and we should see a daily chart pop up on the screen we'll share that and this should give us what what yep. a chart of silver there we go okay so really what we want to look at when we look at at this particular chart here's mid-march and this is really when the market started to to move up tremendously the fact that silver was actually under 12 dollars amazes me i mean it actually broke to 11 and change and when you consider the move from these areas down here at 12 to 30, 36 would be a tripling. And so you've got a tremendously, tremendously large move. I think in terms of upside, the targets that I have, and I will try to put them in for us right now using some of my wave counts, but, and this will give us a much better indication of where we're going. Right now I'm looking for $34 on this leg of a rally. This would be what we call our third wave leg. And then what's going to happen is we're going to have a fifth wave. And that fifth wave should take us to about $37. And it could go as high. This is our top number, $47.50. So in other words, what we believe is that we're getting very, very shallow corrections, obviously. We're probably going to move to roughly $34 here. We might see a sideways pattern, but then my target right now is between $37 and $47 on the upside. Wow, that's, uh, that's quite a call there because that's way, way past what it is now, right? Is it right, at, right now it's at 28, 28.02 and a half cents. So exactly, you're basically but... almost calling for another double on this thing. Yes, and, and it sounds uh, pretty far-fetched. It's a wild stretch. But I remind our listeners one thing. 
If I had told you that we would see silver go below $12 and within four and a half months move to $30, that would seem pretty far-fetched too. Yeah. Yeah, well, far-fetched to some. I knew it was going to happen. Didn't know the magnitude. Didn't know when it was going to start and how far it would go. But uh, I remember interviewing Peter Hug over at Kitco. He's their uh, senior analyst there. Right, right. And last year, he said, uh, I see a high of, uh, I want to say 1550, something like that. And it ended at 1530. This year, he was saying a high of 1911. But obviously, nobody could have forecasted the pandemic although the popping of the economy, we'd all been forecasting for a while. And now to think that uh, silver could go up another $19 an ounce, a 75% increase. And we're talking before the end of the year here, right, Gary? I, I believe so, because I think that once a vaccine is created and becomes disseminated amongst uh, the world's population, it's going to take time to kind of work its way through. But the fact that they have a vaccine and that people are being treated is going to change that pessimistic viewpoint to optimism. But the key is this. What do we have, about 20 million people in the United States without employment currently? that are either underemployed or not employed. I heard 30 million, but it's gone down a bit. Something, I mean, it's it's way high. We had 40 million people apply. I think there's 20 mil million people still collecting it. And uh, how much more they're gonna collect for how long is, well, that's up to the uh, politicians and their machinations. But uh, just call it somewhere between 20 to 30 million, I think is pretty right. accurate. That's a fairly large percentage of the population. Uh, if 30 million would be about one out of every 10 Americans is out of work. So that's going to take a while for those individuals to move back into the workforce. One, there's going to be a lot of changes in the vocations that are available. And two, it's hard to dig yourself out of an area where you're just barely surviving and now you're trying to get a job, but you got to be able to afford first month, last month, you know, all of the things that, that go out of either being homeless or being close to homeless. My fear is that although I know the pandemic in my heart will come and go, the economic fallout I think could last for decades. It really could. Barry Commoner used to say there's no such thing as a free lunch. And the type of economic system we have believes that well, it's absolutely free because they believe that the way you prop up an economy is to just print money. And it, it, it is completely the opposite of the other camp that says, look, if you have a, a severe um, recession, you have economic turmoil, you fight your way through it and you become stronger. That's the Australian, uh, the Austrian technique in terms of their economic outlook of how to solve things. But, but the current thing that we're doing, which began really after World War II, was just to print money. And we know that leads to hyperinflation in some cases. We know that the, the net result at some point is going to be, there's going to be pain in that we have printed more money than we should have, that we, we can support. And I look back to the old days when, and you and I are both gold bugs, and, and this is an interesting time to have that belief, but listen, when there were feudal lords and kings, <laughs> if, you wanted to pay, if you wanted to pay your armies, you went into your little coffers, you grabbed your gold in Japan, it was rice, but, and you paid them, and guess what? When that coffer became empty, you didn't magically say there's more, you went and pillaged and raided yeah. the next town over and got more money, but you lived within your means, although a brutal means, you did not spend more than you had. It just, you couldn't do it. It wasn't how an economic system that started as a barter system worked, but that changed. And so the massive amounts of debt that the United States have accrued, the massive amounts of debt that, that, that other countries have accrued. World, yeah, China. Is, has got to have a detrimental effect further on down the road. It's gonna be hard to make up the difference.
All right. I think we are going to leave it at that, Gary. Really appreciate your your uh, prognostications and your analysis on the topic. I think it's spot on. As far as the pandemic goes, I have a feeling it will be over on November 4th, 2020. I think uh, everyone will forget about it then. I'm not so sanguine about masks as you. I feel like their uh, submission to uh, the totalitarian overlords who are trying to take things over and who may possibly have orchestrated the whole entire uh, response to the pandemic. The pandemic, the disease is real. The response to it is what I find unreal. Gary, just tell us the uh, best place to find you and how do we subscribe? Thegoldforecast.com, we offer a free trial for 14 days. And, and let me just add one final thing to what you've just said. I absolutely agree with you in the fact that the governments have, have used these tools such as social distancing and masks to really put their thumb down on author in, 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 to show their authority. And they've used it as a tool to control people. I'm 100% in agreement. However, even that being said, they might have validity. In other words, I don't believe in what they've done and how they're using these tools, but it doesn't mean the hammer is bad because somebody's using it to hit somebody on the head. A hammer can still build homes. And so it's not the tool that upsets me. It's the authoritarian way the government has been implementing the use of that tool. Yeah, well, we agree on that for sure. And hopefully this nonsense will be over with. There's so many, there's so much science examining the validity of masks. I've had doctors on and not going to get into it, but uh, I do the least intrusive mask possible, which is a neck gaiter, which now they're right, saying right. is even worse than not wearing anything because it aerosolizes droplets. But I figure I am complying with the letter of the law, but I'm going totally against the spirit and I'm taking my hydroxychloroquine. So I probably won't get it anyway, hopefully. Anyway, stay healthy, uh, Gary. We will talk to you again real soon. Any questions or comments for Gary? We would love to hear what your thoughts are. Do you think that gold can really hit, I mean, silver can really hit $47 by the end of the year and gold hit 2300 plus? Is that possible? What do you think? Why don't you email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. If you're on uh, YouTube, whatever podcast platform, we would really appreciate it if you could like, share, and subscribe us. It really helps us a lot when you do that. Uh, I had a, uh, a uh, video about my endeavors with hydroxychloroquine. I had to kind of pull it down. It wasn't favorably received by the powers that be, but you can find it. I think you can find it. You can find it on BitChute. I'll put the bit shoot uh, link up there. Gary, you stay well. We'll talk to you again real soon. Pleasure speaking with you as always, Gary. In radio, it's all about what's next. Go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network, it's all about what's next.